thank you padma uh, thank you for that uh, uh, introduction and uh, can you see my slides yes okay right, okay and hope they move um get me on my can't get them to move hang on i will just all right okay okay um first of all thank you very much for uh, uh, inviting me to be a part of this uh, program and uh, during my presentation i'll keep my uh, the video switch off just so in main to uh, mainly to in, uh, make the clarity of my uh, audio clarity um the objective of this uh, presentation is that uh, okay. let me just try to move The objectives of the uh, presentation uh, for the next half an hour is that to just to give a practical guide for the clinicians um, in order to carry out carry out research and um, uh, particularly with rela related to methodology and also major drawbacks of each method and uh, in each research method and also what are the possible solutions that they can uh, think of and also opportunities available for clinician in each method. Um, and not that each and every method is sort of suitable for a clinician, but then there are, of course, there are methods which are quite uh, easy for the clinician to get engaged in research. So it's not going to be a very exhaustive lecture on the research methodology, and uh, which, of course, I didn't want to do. Now, what are the problems with the wrong methods? Um, if you have chosen the wrong methods to test your uh, research question, an immediate thing would be there will be issues with the approvals and certainly study boards and the ethics uh, review committees and the funders is not going to approve because if the if you are match your research question with the wrong methodology and then from the second hurdle the second hurdle is that it will not be accepted by journals or the conferences um, but let's say that you bypass all these by some way and then the main problem is that they this wrong methodology lead to what are called wrong conclusions some people have to live with that if you really search the internet and then see the contribution of wrong methodology for the wrong, wrong conclusion, there are ample of literature that people have highlighted over the years how the wrong methodology has given wrong conclusions and the people have practiced medicine and they look after their patients based on these conclusions. And later on, people have proven that these are wrong conclusions made on wrong methodology. So it's absolutely necessary that you match your research question with the, with the correct research methodology. Now the studies can be uh, divided into two basic uh, methods. One's called descriptive, where the investigator has a very passive role. He doesn't he, he does not determine you know what these uh, subjects should do. And then there's what I was called interventional studies that Janak was mentioning about, and there the investigator plays a very active role. Uh, what subjects should what, what subject should do? Now descriptive studies where the investigator does not do very much the, in the way of intervention, and then there are four basic methods. There are more than that, but I have chosen just four basic methods, and what is called cohort design, a case control studies, cross sectional studies. And I have added a new one, what is called patient registries, and something which has come up in the recent past, not that young actually, it's a recent past that has come up. And then I will I'll be talking about that, you know, in, in, the, in my presentation. Interventional studies are basic clinical trials that Janaka was talking about. And then, you know, we really do not do enough clinical trials in this country when you compare with other Asian countries. And other Asian countries, they get involved with lots of clinical trials and either part of, let's say, multi-center clinical trials or their own clinical trials in their own countries. But then our involvement in clinical trials as Sri Lankans is very, very minimal. Not very healthy thing to think, really. Now, when you look at the cohort studies, cohort is a group of people with a shared characteristics. They have some commonality. And then this commonality could be they are living in the same village and maybe just certain distance from an emission factory and where I feel that, you know, this emission would affect people. And maybe newborn with high birth weight in the southern province. So they all have one common factor. Or maybe just one batch of undergraduates are admitted to university. Or maybe patient with certain disease like SLE, acute coronary syndrome or stroke or whatever. 
And then since because they are commonality, you choose them and then you follow them up. So you basically measure them at the baseline, whatever you sort of, you know, based on your research question, and then you follow them up for a specific period. And let's say after a period of, let's say, two years or maybe 10 years, you measure the whatever the outcomes that you intended to measure. They come in the form of, let's say, rates of diseases, the quality of life, life expectancy, mortality, and etc. Now, once you have measured that they are what are called the outcomes, you're trying to relate it to the measurements taken at the baseline. So over the years, we have very well known cohort like Framingham study, the Rot Rotterdam thousand family studies, and there are so many what are called well known uh, cohort studies, which have generated uh, plenty of uh, medical uh, knowledge for, for medical community. And then as a result, people know the association between the smoking and lung cancer and how the BMI would contribute to, let's say, osteoarthritis and how the A-level performance and the dropout rate are, are, are related. So you can think of all the relations that you can think of and based on the baseline data that you have measured and the outcome health outcome measures, the outcome measures that you have, you have, you have taken after a period of time. Now, this is a, a graphic representation of a cohort study. So at the baseline, people can be can be divided in what is called exposed and non-exposed. And then on their whatever characteristic, like a smoking habits on the alcohol consumption, maybe on the BMI, high BMI, low BMI, people living within, let's say, one kilometer of the emission factory, people living beyond one kilometer of emission factory. So you can divide them into subgroups. And then you can compare the incidence of whatever the outcome that you will have after a period of time. And then this is how the cohort studies look like. Since they are sort of, you know, the, 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 you, are, you are looking at, you know, from the exposure to the outcome, and then you pick them on the, on the exposure and measure the outcome, they are called prospective studies, the prospective design. Now, there are advantages of cohort studies because the chronological order of the exposure and the outcomes is very clear. Because at the time you picked up the patients on a smoking behavior, people did not have lung cancer or let's say bladder cancer. So the bladder cancer actually came late and then you know that the exposure came first and the outcome came, came later. So that order, the time, uh, uh, what's called the association is pretty, pretty clear. And also, it's relatively easy to get ethical approval. I'd say relatively easy to get ethical approval because there's no intervention. So that part, you don't have to worry about that. And also, it allows you to measure what's called multiple outcomes for a single exposure. For example, smoking and the cancers, you can measure several types of cancers. Let's say lung cancer, maybe pharyngeal or pharyngeal, or bladder cancer, pancreatic, whatever you can think that you know would associate with smoking. So you can measure multiple outcomes, maybe ischemic heart disease, and a chronic obstructive airway disease. So there are, it allows you to measure so many things. So that's the beauty of that. But then comes the disadvantages because there's, there can be a long gap between the exposure and the outcome. For example, if that is, let's say, separated by, let's say, 10, 15 years, one decade or two decades, and maybe that the investigator or the researcher would retire before that, you know, before the outcome came, or maybe the subject may outlive, the investigator so that investigator may not be there you know at the time that they develop outcomes so that's a long time gap is a real disadvantage and also they are relatively expensive because even for you to take what are called the baseline measurements it's a colossal sum of money to spend on that because if you take let's say thousand people you you, you decide to measure their lipids and the other 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 things and then it becomes quite expensive Another problem is that what are called missing cases because people change the geography, they are, they are living um, status and they move out of the places and they go overseas. So there are missing cases is something that again, we have to live with if we are doing cohort studies. Okay. Now, are they not really for clinician having said all that what are called drawbacks? Can't clinician get involved with the cohort studies? Not really. And I have put asterisks at the top of this in two asterisks because there are possible opportunities for clinicians. Wherever I have put two asterisks in my slides, and that's in these are opportunities for clinicians. Now, there are what are called short term or short term outcomes that you can measure. Now, for example, if you take, let's say, events in the first trimester and the outcome of the pregnancy, the maternal and the fetal outcome, and certainly it is done within, let's say, two years, you should be able to complete your study. 
and is a covid designer and if you decide to short term outcomes of the covid 19 patient with a lung injury i'm certain i mean something certain you can do within couple of years there are people thinking of dermatological manifestations of post uh the dengue hepatitis sorry dengue hemorrhagic fever patients now there are some of them are developing alopecia and some so you can you can you can do that and also the performance of the university undergraduates uh, you need only about let's say 5 6 years for that you don't have to spend a lot of time so actually saying that clinician not that they cannot in, involve get involved with the what are called four studies and when there's a short term outcome where the gap and the exposure and the outcome is not far huge and then certainly you can do that and the other advantage of the clinician service is that it is to find cases and also minimum missing cases if it is a short term outcome right now from there i'll get into what i sort of case control studies and instead of uh, picking up people on the exposure now in this situation we pick up the people on the outcome for example disease or a condition and then we inquire about the exposure which occurred in the past so people very wrongly label them say they are retrospective studies but they are really not retrospective they are prospective and then only thing they are they are collecting retrospective data that's only only difference but they are not retrospective studies let's say if you get a young acute coronary syndrome let's say you define them as less than 40 years and if you are interested to find out their age that they get exposed to tobacco the first time and then you can do that because you can pick up young acute coronary syndrome patients and inquire about the the time they get exposed to the cause first time and also if you want to find out the fatal abnormalities and the first trimester infections and the drugs exposure and certainly it's something that can be easily doable so only problem is that the case control study these are about cases that i'm talking about you need a control group so um, that i will have a little bit of time because getting a control group is sometimes a little more difficult than finding cases the advantages of case control study is that there's a ideal for uncommon diseases let's say if you're looking for let's say fetal abnormalities not that you have to wait for 1000 child birth you know to let's say 10 uh, abnormalities and then this thing would be to pick up uh, the, the child newborns with abnormal abnormalities and then include them in a case control study and then there can be a long gap between the exposure and the and the outcome and then as a result of that people can have what are called recall limitations and recall bias so when you ask them you know first time they get exposed to tobacco may that people have a limitation of their recalling that 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 information and then that is actually a uh, common for the controls and common for the causes cases as well so recall limitation is not a huge problem because since it is is occurring equally in the cases as well as controls and we don't see recall limitation as a huge problem but the major pro- major problem comes what is called the recall bias now think of this situation let's say mother who has delivered a abnormal child would sit on the bed and then think about you know over and over again what have i done wrong during my pregnancy for me to have a child like this and she will very systematically and carefully go through all the details from the first time she got a pregnancy test positive and until she delivered the baby and recalling and collecting and then analyzing whatever the information so when you give a questionnaire for these let's say patients and then they will be very well they will answer these questions because they have gone through this one but a mother who has delivered a normal child and would would not remember that you know she had some drugs and she had some infection because there's no reason for her to think about it so the people what's called the recall bias is a serious limitation of case control studies there are ways to get out of that but again i'm not going to go into details of the of that one now now case control studies are again for two aspects because this is something that the clinician should 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 do because you know I mean, this is very easy thing now when you when you try to do that one thing to remember is that what is called the selection of cases i have seen over and again over and over again people have selected cases but then these cases have not been selected based on let's say case definition now the case definition is a, is a required thing because you must say this is how you going to uh, uh, define your case 
It can be criteria based, for example, acute coronary syndrome as well as some criteria, SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, polymalgia, rheumatica. Now, there are well defined criteria for this. So, it's a it is for a uniform, it provides a uniform base for some good diagnosis cases. The histology may, may be malignancy, so you got histology, so that's quite consistent. The problem comes in some other ones, like for example, when you are using clinical information, let's say when I say clinical information, clinical features plus lab investigations. It can again be relatively something like a dengue fever, like test virus. It's a fever and then you know positive serology, and then you know you probably think of you know a, a clinician would agree that this is a dengue or test virus. But the difficulty comes something like a pulmonary tuberculosis. Would you take all the cases with a let's say smear positive? Or would you take all the cases where the culture sputum and you know how difficult it is? And then there are people who get pulmonary tuberculosis where the sputum negative, MON2 negative, patient had diabetes, and then you know, give a specific NTB drugs and they responded. And we know that's tuberculosis. So are you going to ignore that patient? So difficulties comes at the time of you know certain diagnosis like that. And then you must say, hang on, I'm going to use a definition which is acceptable to clinicians. If the clinician says, well, it's a pulmonary tuberculosis, I agree. And then, you know, you can use something like that. So remember that, you know, the, how you define your case is, is very important. Now, ideally, let's say cases should be a random sample of all possible cases in the source population. For example, all acute stroke in the gold district. So that's what the cases that you're going to be. But that's an ideal situation you will never be able to achieve. Because there are patients who die at home with acute stroke. And actually, that's the patient, very patient that you need to study, put into a study, because that's the one who has the highest mortality. But then you don't have that patient in your study sample because the patient never made it to the hospital. And there are patients who are not admitted actually to hospitals. And then people who are going for alternative therapies and all. So really speaking, you cannot get into this ideal situation to select a random sample of all possible cases in the source population. It's not, it's not possible. But actually what we do is commonly we have a selection of available cases for medical care facility, for example, those admin teaching hospital karapitia. But then I know that in my mind, I have, I, I have got hold of some patients which are really important, but again, I have got them, but then something that will be. Now, there are actually what are called incident cases and the prevalent cases. Important that actually, because incident cases are what are called new cases. The prevalent cases are new cases plus the old cases. And then the information, the conclusions you make on these two types of cases can be completely different, completely contrast. And then you may come into some kind of you know, wrong conclusions about the particular about the uh, the etiology and the, and the predisposing factors. So my, uh, my, my suggestion is that you try to include incident cases as much as possible. Now, if you think the selection of cases was a bit of a problem, but then selection of control is a, is, a, is a bigger problem. And problem is that, let's say you have taken a patient with acute coronary syndrome, but then how are you going to exclude the absence of acute coronary syndrome in the, in the control? To what extent do you go? You take a history, you do examination, that's not very helpful. You run an ECG, you rest ECG, you know that's not going to be helpful. Would you do excise ECG? Maybe ethical ethics give approval for that, but you know that again is not very sensitive to rule out. So you can have 80% doc in your coronary artery and waiting to have a myocardial infarction in two months' time, and then you produce a, a normal, let's say, excise uh, uh, ECG. So certainly ethics would not allow you to do angiogram for the people, you know, control. That's not that's not possible. So that is one of the problems that you have to live with. And also you had to have uniform criteria for those groups. Let's say you you picked up breast cancers on the mammography and the and the physical examination, and then you must do the mammography for the controls as well. Okay. And the another bigger problem comes is from where are you going to pick them? Now who's the best control and where should they come from? Ideally, cases come from population and the control also come from the same population. And I will give an example and try to listen. We call it actually what's called based population, study based. Now, we control must be at risk of getting a disease. And that is why we always do what's called age and gender match. Now, for example, if you take patients with the hip fractures 
and we make sure the control also age and the gender match because that is very much depend on the age and also very much depend on the gender and then two case control the control should resemble the case except that they have they have no disease now for example about the location of the of the of the controls let's say if it's a hospital base you can pick up them for opd and the other clinics but then you can argue and say the people who come to opd come from a, let's say a certain social uh, uh, let's say economical group because you are then cutting out a certain social economic groups now is it a community now for example if i'm doing a study on rheumatoid arthritis at in rheumatology clinic rheumatology and rehabilitation clinic and teach us to therapy here and i think i'm very well okay to take cases from gold hill district because it's very likely that patient in the gold district would like to come to rheumatology clinic because of their disabilities and this and that they would prefer to come to the rheumatology clinic in teach us to therapy here but if i go to the the cardiothoracic unit in teach us to therapy here and then pick up the piece of patients who are waiting for the coronary artery bypass surgery and then find out cases from gold district i'm completely going wrong because the cases from kc the, the the surgery cardiac surgery come from all over because his catchment area is not gold district he gets from badul and mundragala and maybe from jaffna so i get cases from all over so getting getting controls from gold district is not going to be a correct one so how we have come out of that is actually we have chosen what is called the neighborhood controls so when we pick up the patient at his fracture we say well next time you come to the clinic you bring three people same age same gender and we ask them to bring three and out of three we select one or two people and one thing is that they actually match for what is called socio economic status because people with socio economic status of same socio economic status tend to live, to live in the same loca- location and then at least they are match for age gender and the socio economic status that's a good thing you can do matching controls now you can do individual matching or the frequency match and then that is try to don't try to overdo it actually and get him matching to let's say age and gender but don't try to do it overdo it because then you get into problems really now uh, that's about over matching now another thing is that you may have you may come across studies where the people have got let's say a two controls for a one case or three controls for a one case that is actually when you look at the statistics it enhances the power of the study and by matching more than one but then when you look at the graph actually there's no advantage of including more than three so the the statistician always say keep it less than less than four so we can go up to 2 go up to 3 but not go beyond that so that will be a waste of time and waste of energy and resources if you try and do that because you are not going to enhance power beyond that now cross section study from the case control i get into what is called cross section studies and where you measure the exposure and the outcome at the same time and then the problem comes here is that the Uh, you have no way to establish what is called this chronological order for example let's say if you are measuring something like uh, association between the bmi and the osteoarthritis and you will be asking question which came first is that became osteoarthritis they became osteoarthritis first and then for some genetic reason they cut down their physical activities and became obese or is that obesity came first and then as a result they got this so that kind of association you can establish but then the chronological order is very difficult to establish they are relatively easy and inexpensive multiple exposures and the multiple outcomes can be assessed and also it allows for let's say subgroup analysis like a male female young and old and then you know and socio economic status education you can do subgroup analysis they are beautiful and there are plenty of statistical calculations possible this is in contrast to cohort studies and the case control where you have the statistical calculations are quite limited and that is one of the drawback but come to cross section where a plenty of you have and uh, compare groups two groups three groups more than four groups so that we can run association like correlations and the regression and everything and then you know quite plenty of associated the calculation that can so generally statistician they allow this particular design because there are plenty of things that you can do now this suits clinicians there are many options actually you have clinic patients you have involved patients and then 
even though you have plenty of options, the mistake that the clinicians do is when I go through the what are called research proposals that they are not being innovative. We have we have over and over again go through what we call complications of diabetes in, in clinic clinic patients. Now people have done that studies over and over again. And then somebody gave a justification that, well, we know this information in Kalam, but we don't this information in Mondragal. Let's do it at Mondragal and see and, and conclude the whole same thing again. So that people trying to, you know, walk the pathway that as Janaka said that, you know, earlier, that pathway that people have traveled many times before is not going to be very innovative, really. And same with the drug usage in different diseases, people to find out whether people with acute coronary syndrome four months later taking the drugs. But then, you know, certainly it should be done. I'm not saying it shouldn't be done. It shouldn't be done, but then not that everybody should do that. Now, there are new areas people can think of if you are trying to get involved. There's a quality of life of patients and their determinants. And as again, that Janaka said that, you know, I mean, now this is the information that although people have done that, let's say in the West, right now this is actually going to be geographical variation between the say, quality of life and the determinants we very well will know that you know there will be differences mm -hmm. and it's something that you can do so do study of that you know they can duplicate here patient satisfaction utilization of health services there are marginalized populations like you know so that you can think of you know studying and then um Old, old age, people into old age, etc. So people can be innovative. I want the clinician to be innovative in selecting these areas because cross-section studies, again, can be very useful. Now, the patient registry is something that actually I, I really something that, you know, I introduced here. And the patient registry is actually is an organized system of data collection. So it's a useless observational study method, very much similar to cohort studies. And then if you really sit and see that, you know, there are a lot of similarities and not very subtle differences between the two. And you can say it's a subset of cohort design. Doesn't matter really. You're not really worried about those things. You collect uniform data from all patients. It could be clinical or other, right? And I'll come to that actually in the my second slide why this uniform data is required. And also you evaluate what is called predetermined specific outcomes. If it is too 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 difficult, I will say. Now in Sri Lanka, we get what we call disease registry. We get what is called cancer register of Sri Lanka, which collect the age and the sex and the type of cancer. So that is not actually based on some kind of you know hypothesis. You are not collecting that data based on hypothesis. You probably want to look at the what's called the age distribution of let's say oropharyngeal cancer and the gender distribution, maybe the area, and then over the let's say trends over let's say period of time, you know, over a decade or something like that. Beyond that, you can't do that really. Because that is not on a predetermined, let's say, uh, exposure and outcome. There's no research question. So patient registry has a research question. And also define outcomes which are defined. There's a time bound, let's say two years, three years. They can run for, let's say, 10 years. It doesn't matter really, but general time bound. And data collected in a systematic manner because you meet all these patients in the registry from time to time and collect this data. And for example, it's called hip fracture registry that we have, we have uh, run and then uh, that so the disease registry is actually is completely different of that patient registry is not appropriate for common diseases like diabetes hypertension but those with identifiable beginning like a hip fracture acute coronary syndrome breast cancer they are ideal maybe chronic renal failure on dialysis not chronic or chronic renal failure but that's too common actually but then chronic renal failure on dialysis may be a good uh, patient registry maybe type 1 diabetes and this is actually a type of studies that we have published in the in the recent past, arising from the patient registries. The clinical trials um, is not impossible, and uh, is something that you know people should think positively. And interventional, they are investigated, decide on the type of intervention, like a dose and the frequency, how they should take duration, all. There's a strict methodology and safety precautions. And then all that can be learned, what is called good clinical practice certificate. I know, I know that Chandani is going to talk about ethics and certainly she will mention about it and good clinical practice certificate, which can be obtained in Sri Lanka. Now there's a document that people who wish to do clinical trials, I want you to read what's called consort statement is consolidated standards of reporting trials. All my old people who are doing clinical trials, I mean, now this thing, you get them to read. It's actually originally 
uh, made to for reporting clinical trials in, 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 in journals, but then people use it as a checklist for the completeness of the methods. That's good. Now, this is a consort website, really, if you want to see. So, summary Sri Lankan clinicians' involvement research is not very satisfactory, and there is a situation that can be improved. And I really appreciate the steps taken by the SLM to, uh, uh, to chip in with the type of you know, program. And these things should be repeated in a periodic manner so that people get doses, repeated doses. Why reasons for these people not getting involved in the research? As Janaka said, that you know there are obvious there are reasons, but then these reasons cannot be sort of you know entertained all, all the time. Uh, true that resources are limited, but then you should be able to get out of you know situation, think out of that, you know, make sure that you do uh, with available resources, and certainly that can be done. But only thing you need to spend some time on that. And promote clinician generate data while they are working. One of the one of the major things we have asked clinician why you're not doing research, I have no time. So let them generate data while they are working. And then they don't have to go to I mean they, the thing that they think that they, they should go to the community and do a research. That's for the community medicine people, actually, not for the not for the clinician. And the basic knowledge on research would help them. And then they need repeated doses because this research knowledge changes from time to time. And then they need repeated doses. So with that, I think I'll stop. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we have a few questions. Yes. One question is, can't we do a cohort study as a retrospective one? Certainly you can, but I call retrospective cohorts. Um, one of the major problems that we have in, the Sri, in Sri Lanka, I mean, I, for the last three years, I've been the chairman board of study, and then, you know, I've gone through a couple of proposals, and then we don't have a systematic way of collecting data from patients. For example, let's say if I want to get my patients with a certain disease, and then see, let's say, family history or the some information, let's say, simple smoking habits or the social habits, do doctors record that information in a, in a uniform manner in, in bedhead tickets? Whether you can retract that is a problem. So retrospective cohorts are not impossible, can be done, but only only limitation is that we don't have a system that you will give a reliable data which are, which are sort of recorded in a uniform manner. So you know, you and me know about, you know, how the, how the doctors, BC doctors, you know, and uh, they, they say smoking plus alcohol plus, that's all. So you want that in the units per, let's say, year or something like that, smoking practice, so that information can never get like. So that's a limitation, otherwise it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a possibility. Right, so thank you. There's another question. If someone needs to do a comparison of two methods, example, dipstick and biochemistry, what kind of study is this? Is this process, case yeah. control study? Now, now this actually, this, most of the lab studies actually belong to what is called cross-sectional design. And uh, there's a cross-sectional design. So you are checking the, uh, what's called the um, agreement of the two methods, is it? Is that the, the question? Dipstick and the sorry the biochemistry. Yeah, yeah. So biochemistry usually the lab based results come under what is called the cross sectional study, cross sectional design. Right. So another question, sir. Uh, can we observe one group over a period without a control? If so, what type of a study is this? Mm. This um you can do that, I'm sorry. You can do that, but only that the that data that you generate is not going to be very useful. For example, let's say you observe and say this type of people, you know, uh, drop out from uh, this thing or some something. But then people would say how that compare with the with the normal population, and then without getting idea about the how it is distributed in the among the other people, and then you have a problem of sort of you know how you going to interpret it. And I know that, you know, once I was listening to one of the presentations and then, you know, that's a, a patient with epilepsy and then uh, let's say so many people use motorcycles to come to work. But then people said, how does it compare with the other people who have no epilepsy and then come into this thing? Is it a, you know, I mean, certainly you can say this is a risk factor and then they can make it an accident. So that much is important. But Kaguri that compares with whether you are overusing or whether they are underusing or they are, they have a 
you know restrictions of like that a critical information cannot be gathered cannot be can be you know obtained by just having a one study sample but there are there are for example let's say if you get a patient with a dengue fever and then you are going to get a let's say looking at their alopecia and something like that and certainly i mean that can be done that type of thing can be done i'm not saying that cannot be done it all depends on your research question your research question does it require control group so thank you um, sir a final question because of the time constraint what yeah. constraints what is the problem with overmatching right overmatching yeah overmatching you know let's say if you got a patient you know, i get a patient with this fracture let's say patient's age i'll take a consideration age i won't take five years this or this way or that way i want the same gender and then i say well you are come from mondragal i will think i will think of getting the control from mondragal that's fine then i know the alcohol consumption is again one of the problem with the with a, with a hip fracture now i want do i get a patient with the same alcohol consumption and same smoking habit can i get now you will never be able to get that actually unless you go to mondragal and then in that area that you know even that area and find somebody you won't be able to get that so overmatching problem is that difficult to find patient living in same area same age same sex smoking same quantity and taking alcohol same quantity doing the physical activities same amount and eating the same diet you will never be able to do that so just get the what are called the gross confounders in the in the this thing and then identify them and then match for those so that's what if you want to do research that's why you do it but don't try to overmatch thank you very much sir for that very informative presentation no we will move on thank to you. the next presentation okay. now